Hi, everybody. Welcome. This is Samantha Chow, Senior Analyst with ITA Group, covering life insurance and annuities. This is the Insurance Nexus webinar titled Pave the Way Through to True Customer Centricity. I'm excited to have you on today. This is a great topic that I know that my clients and, and other carriers that I speak to regular, regularly are constantly asking me questions about. And as it is, I have just released some very positive uh, research on this particular topic that I'm happy to introduce to, to kick us off before I send us over to Anna and John. So first of all, again, this is, this is a big topic that crosses all lines of business throughout the insurance industry. And we are making waves through digital transformation and the use of data in our industry, but we still have quite a ways to go to catch up with under, other industries. One of those bigger topics that is top of mind is centered around customer centricity, engagement through rewards and incentive programs and the use of connected devices such as physical activity trackers, health related devices, auto and home uh, IoT devices, et cetera. And it's, it's been great to, to kind of watch all the different research that's been happening out there as it relates to this type of connected policyholder, connected consumer. But there have been some roadblocks keeping insurance carriers to moving in the direction of being connected, whether that means it's through mobile apps or com computer engagement through, through emails to their policyholders or connected devices, IoT. And you know, contrary to some of those industry myths, policyholders are more tech savvy than they ever. And again, like I said, I'm the life and annuities analyst. So I'm a little biased in my, in my research. So I'm gonna talk mostly uh, through this research on life insurance, but this same research exists at ITA Group for auto, home, and health. But specifically, when you look at a life insurance policyholder who's been typically an older person throughout this, you know, throughout our industry timeline, three out of every four actually own and use a laptop regularly amongst other types of devices, but they even look to use and embrace newer technologies with many desiring to be first users or early adopters, and that's never been the case. So it's prime. Um, in this, uh, our policyholders or consumers are really big on loyalty programs. Life insurance policyholders specifically, 92% of them actually participate in at least one major type loyalty program, whether that be a retail, grocery, airline, credit card, et cetera. And even 47% show interest in getting that type of pro program by their insurance carrier or life insurance carrier. They own connected devices, 85% own or have plans to own at least one type of common connected devices. Uh, thinking about that in terms of your smartwatch, your physical activity trackers, um, it, it, the Amazon Alexa or Google Home, et cetera. So there is a way to connect digitally with that policy holder. And Regardless of whether, you know, when you think about sharing, they're definitely willing to share data. They're sh willing to share personal data. They're willing to share it short term for underwriting. They're also willing to share it long term for re rewards type programs. Um, it, it, it's not something that would hold them back. And when you consider the types of uh, health-related devices when it comes to life insurance. Two-thirds of life insurance policyholders policy actually own health-related devices, and they actually use them to a high degree. And they're willing to sh share this data, again, for underwriting or even long-term. And when given a detailed description, and this is where I think this research really kind of set us apart from a lot of the other stuff that was, that's been floating around out there, we gave a detailed example of what type of program we were talking about, a rewards program that would allow them to gain either points towards uh, catalog or purchasing items, reduction in premiums, gift cards, those things. We went very deep into that. We also went deep into the percentage of a reward that, would, that, that they would receive. 
and more than half of policyholders showed interest in this type of program and would be willing to share the data from at least one of the health-related devices that we listed. And keep in mind that this is all based on true live policyholders today that have to purchase and pay for not just group voluntary free product, but have to had to look, apply, go through underwriting, and pay for their policy. On top of that, nine, nearly 70% of all life insurance policyholders showed some level of interest in a rewards program for their life insurance carrier and would, re, would enroll for a reward value of 15% or less. That's it, it, we were we were concerned that there was a, a our hypothesis was that a, the percentage wouldn't be enough. But when you whittle that down to a five percent or less, there is very little gain between that five percent and fifteen percent uh, reward amount, which was very interesting to us uh, as as a research firm. A very big aha moment that said this is something that's doable in terms of pricing. Uh, for the insurance carrier, and the same applies regardless of the type of insurance that we we spoke to them about. So the other component of this is, you know, would they seek out information? Would they switch their life insurance carrier? M more than half of those life insurance policyholders said that they would seek out more information about these types of programs. And what's scary is half of those people said they would switch to find someone who could engage with them in this type of program to help save them money or give them a reward. And then if you think about those concerns, what is the concern? Why wouldn't you do this? Obviously, data security is the top of that. It has nothing to do with sharing their data. Uh, it's more about being hacked, stolen, or their data falling into the wrong hands. So our industry is ripe for this connected uh, vision that we all have to improve engagement, improve experience, uh, and become more connected with our with our policyholders. And I know that we have uh, Anna here with Sun Life and John with One Beacon that will be joining us. And they have a lot to say on this topic. And I'd like to turn it over to Anna first to kind of introduce herself. Uh, what she's doing at Sun Life, the role she's playing, and how some of the things that they're doing at L Sun Life are impacting the customer cent centricity, the connected digital uh, carrier that I know everybody is looking to move forward with. Anna? Wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, my name's Anna Foe. I'm a director in the Digital Transformation Office at Sun Life Financial. Um, I joke that insurance is my family business. My dad was an executive at Prudential and my mom was a life underwriter at uh, various Canadian insurers, but I took a very different tact for the first 10 or 15 years of my career and I worked in software. So I have a kind of interesting perspective having grown up in traditional startups and software companies, but having this kind of background dinner table conversation around the business of insurance. So it's been a pleasure and an honor to, to talk a little bit today about some of the work that we've done at Sun Life that we're really proud of uh, and some of the, the future things that we're thinking about. So you alluded to it a little bit in your introduction, but I mean, this stuff's hard. If it was easy, we would have already figured it out. Combining that right client experience in a frictionless business that crosses a traditional call center, which most big insurers um, have and have relied on in the past. Uh, we have a mobile app that we're proud of that keeps winning awards certainly doing some things around voice. Uh, we have a career sales force as well as third-party advisors. Um, and unfortunately, but the reality is, we still have paper forms. So figuring out how to deliver the right experience across all of those channels uh, is no small feat. But new consumer technologies are making things possible. And we're looking at personalizing digital services because we know that, that that's what our consumers are demanding. But at the same time, we need to balance the needs of our existing customers. Um, we need to attract the new ones. Uh, we need to fit the needs of our advisors, as well as you know, figuring out how to make all this work in an organization that has a 150 year history. So our existing employees that have made us successful to this point, and then a bunch of new talent that we want to attract. So <laughs> a lot of competing interests, but proudly we're one of the world's largest insurers 
and we're trying to navigate these changing expe expectations with some style and grace. Uh, we have a long, proud history built on lots of industry firsts. Uh, we introduced the first unconditional life insurance policy. We were the first to offer group life insurance in Canada and our subsidiary MFS invented the mutual fund. But we know that we can't let sit on our laurels uh, despite being at the forefront of product development, digital technology and new client realities are ever changing. Uh, the environment's evolving at lightning speed. Yesterday's best practice is really just today's norm and tomorrow's museum piece. So we're always surveying the landscape for ways to keep our competitive edge. And we're investing in some key building blocks that we believe will ramp up our client focus. We're reinventing processes, we're, invent we're investing in groundbreaking digital tools, and really taking a look at enhancing our leadership position. So first I wanna talk about a very fundamental change that we made that has nothing to do with technology, bells and whistles, but we think is foundational in serving us in this mission. We know it's not feasible for insurance companies to flirt with the idea of customer, customer centricity. Those expectations that I talked about that are changing are demanding personalized services, uh, personal value propositions, and all the latest and greatest technological advancements. So rather than resist updating our business models and risk losing customers, we found a new way. We're gonna go straight to the source, the customer. We created a client experience office. And in this office, we have a senior vice president, chief client experience officer, whose focus is on understanding, anticipating and responding to client needs. In 2007, we launched another Canadian life industry first with the introduction of Ella. She's our interactive digital coach who helps clients fully utilize their benefit and pension plan uh, benefits. This new technology was made available online, first through our mobile app, uh, and soon after it helped clients appreciate the plans provided by their employers like never before. So say you have money in your healthcare spending or wellness account that you didn't know was about to expire. Ella prompts you to lose it, use it. Or perhaps your daughter's turning 21 and you didn't realize she will soon need her own healthcare coverage to replace your benefits coverage. Ella knows all about that and can help that with that too. Maybe you didn't know your employer will match your retirement savings. She can make sure that you also take advantage of those benefits. We just know that in today's busy and complicated world, it's really hard to keep track of everything. And benefits and pension plan details are no different. We think that Ella being a coach to keep an eye on our, our clients' plans and surfacing information that is useful to folks at the time that it's relevant really will help our clients um, realize the, the benefits of the work that we're doing behind the scenes. Just to kind of pull the covers back a little bit, Ella was built on a technology internally that we call Digital Benefits Assistant. It's a client engagement platform that we launched in 2016 and uses advanced analytics and big data technology to present an array of helpful and important ideas to clients at key life moments. Ella personifies this experience that we were aspiring to provide for our clients. She's caring, she's knowledgeable, she's optimistic, and she empowers clients to understand their needs and options and take action. We developed Ella out of the fundamental belief in the power of insight and advice, not someone reacting to a question, but someone who's really looking out for our clients' health and financial well-being. Um, wh whether it's the way we exercise, shop, or consume entertainment, we just know our, our, our clients are connected the way, in a way that they've never been before, and Ella starts providing some of that choice. Then last year in 2018, we put Ella into our Google Home platform. It not only expands her functionality, but it grows her potential audience beyond our clients. Initially launched just to help our clients access information about benefits and pension information, our new Google Home version helps anyone with a smart speaker locate healthcare professionals. We can activate the voice enabled home assistant with, hey Google, can I speak to Sun Life? And then both clients and all Canadians can use this to locate dentists or massage therapists, for example. The search function steered by more than 10,000 ratings issued by clients who are asked to rate their healthcare practitioners when they file a claim through the, through the app. Our assistant has helped reach 1.5 million clients in Canada, uh, and we see that she has pushed in-plan wealth deposits 16% higher over the last 12 months. She's smart now, but she's still learning. 
our plan is to make Ella AI driven over time to take the predictive model and make it self learning. She's smart in the sense that all of her nudges are now algorithms and we've rolled out almost 200 of these on different things that we have data on and how you're reacting to those nudges. The nudges may advise on issues such as healthcare best practices or how to save on medical products. Do you ignore them? Do you click on them? Do you just read them? Or do you click on them and take action? The personalized data that we have teaches Ella about your preferences so she could learn even more things about you, like when's the best time of day to put these nudges on your mobile device? We became the first major benefits carrier to offer, offer gender affirmation coverage in Canada for such things like um, transgender procedures. Um, we thought that, you know, we just really need to react to society and figure out the ways that we can serve the changing needs. Um, in Asia, uh, I'll to kind of turn and talk a little bit about Asia. Uh, we certainly see in Asia that data is a glue that brings the holistic synergies between all the digital assets we have, all the physical channels, and to make all of these things come together in a streamlined uh, experience. We really believe across the globe that data is the bond between digital assets, physical channels, and the other purely data-driven business, data-driven decision-making, getting insight and having the right level of analytics. And then I'll move on to our group business. In our group business, we have two groups. One, the brokers, our third-party insurance firms, uh, and the employers, the end clients. We have invested time and energy in, in uncovering both of their needs. We really think that um, you know, what brokers con consider to be table stakes should be things that we need to start looking at digitizing and infusing that perspective into our company culture. Traditionally only reached through sales representatives, brokers really now have a direct two-way channel to connect to us. This gives us the chance to know brokers better and understand better how their expectations of carriers are changing. For example, we learned through the community that brokers have different digital needs based on the size and type of firm they work for. As a result, we started tailoring our services that we offer to these brokers. We learned, for example, that mid-sized brokers often lack digital resources that their clients expect. So a carrier that offers these resources would be a, a very attractive partner. Late last year, we announced an investment and strategic relationship with Rise People, Canada's first and only all-in-one HR payroll and benefits administration solution. Sun Life and Rise are collaborating to bring new digital connections and services to forward-looking businesses across the country. Rise's platform masters the complexity of managing employers, administration needs, HR, time tracking, payroll, and benefits administration brought together in a, in a simple, single system, offering choice, convenience, and personalization to employees while reducing employer costs. Together, we think we can drive an even greater value for employers and employees, including unparalleled onboarding and enrollment experience, a complete HR and benefits experience for employees that maximizes their health, productivity, and engagement, and a total integration with Sun Life, giving administrators a one and done tool that brings greater cost savings, accuracy, and efficiency. We know firsthand group benefits and HR administration are complex. We think that this partnership will offer even better and more interesting ways that we can work. And then finally, let me talk about the work we're doing with Luge Capital. I alluded to this earlier. We can't rest on our laurels. Um, Luge Capital is a 75 million venture capital fund that was launched to develop early stage fintech companies and artificial intelligence applications for financial services. So despite all the great work we've done thus far, the work is never done. Uh, we made an investment into Luge, um, Luge named for the winter sport for those outside of Canada that involves hurtling down an icy course at high speed. They concentrate on seed and Series A financing. They make investments between a quarter million and $2 million. Uh, they're looking for mission-driven companies that challenge the way the world interacts with financial services. So we certainly have had a really powerful partnership with Luge Capital and are working with them as they do diligence on some of the brightest lights in the Canadian tech scene, working in FinTech and AI, uh, so that we constantly stay ahead of the curve. Uh, I hope that provided uh, some good context and uh, happy when the time is right to answer questions. But thank you so much for the opportunity.
Thanks, Anna. That's great, man. For somebody who said that you're still working with a lot of paper, you sound like you've got a little, you may, you have made a lot of uh, headway in, in digi digi digitizing uh, Sun Life. So uh, I got, I have a ton of questions myself. Um, but uh, before I turn it over to, to John to introduce himself and what he has going on over at One Beacon Insurance, I'd like to uh, let our audience know that if you have any questions, please feel free to uh, send them to us through, through the chat and we will get those organized in a fashion that uh, Anna and John can answer them as soon as they're done with their with their introductions. Uh, don't leave it to me because I'll, I'll take over with all the questions. Uh, now I'd like to turn it over to a re first a, a, a recording from John. Uh, he will be joining us, but uh, he had to be a few minutes late, so he gave us a recording for his introduction. Paul, can you kick that over? Good day. This is John Wurzler speaking to you from the United States. I'm the president of the Online On Demand Division of the One Beacon Insurance Company, a wholly owned insurance company of Intact Financial in Canada. Our mission is to develop products for the marketplace through our traditional agent and broker channels using our legacy systems as a foundation. As you can imagine, this can be quite a daunting task. One of the things I'd like to address with you this morning is the customer's needs. What are they? Our customers are looking for specialty insurance products, which is our fundamental product to the marketplace. These products range from insuring municipalities and large ocean-going tankers to high-technology life science pharmaceutical companies and many other industries. So our products are specialty. And as such, we have to think very carefully about how to bring our products to our distributors in a package that they can sell to their special customers. In order to do that, we spend a great deal of time and energy meeting with the customer, which is our insurance broker or agent, and our insured, which is the customer of our insurance agent and broker. We need to understand what the insured needs are and make sure that we understand how to deliver them, which might mean changing the wording on a policy. It might mean changing the questions we ask in order to achieve the desired results in order to give them a quote. Once we understand what the insights are, we start to develop the product. We start with the basic fundamental questions we need to understand how to identify what marketplace they're in, what segment they might be in, what their risk category might be. We try to keep those questions as brief as possible and often make them yes or no with very little room for um, narrative. Narrative is hard to understand on a computer system today. Once we've got that down to a fundamental design, we then go back out and see the insured customers again with their agents and brokers, and we review it with them. We ask them if this works for them. We ask them to complete, first we ask them to complete the questions and walk through this in a live demonstration environment. And then we ask them for their feedback. Have we missed anything? Have we been too broad in our questioning? Do we need to drill down any further? We also ask the agents and brokers the same questions because they've been working with their insured customers for years. We take all that information and we bring it back to our development lab and we start to modify the questions based on the input we got from these customers. We then go out and see them again after we've made the changes. And we continue to do this through the development cycle over a 60-day period of time. We've got it refined. We then ask 20 insurance agents and brokers around the United States to be our early adopters for the product and take it out to the marketplace. We continue to monitor very carefully the interaction between the agents and brokers and their customers, looking at the quotes that we deliver, as well as the policies when they make a sale. 
halfway through this test period, we sit down with these agents or brokers again and ask them for their feedback. How is it going? What have we missed? What needs to be changed? Are the limits right? Are the deductibles right? Are the coverages right? Do we need to add anything? Do we need to take anything away? We get to the end of our development cycle. We review this with the owner of the business here at One Beacon. And we show them what we've built. And by the way, they are involved in our agent broker meetings throughout the process. But now it's their chance to take one more last look before we release this thing publicly to the broader marketplace and ask them if there's anything that needs to be changed. Are the rates right? Are the rule sets right? Are the deductibles right? Are the forms right? Do we need anything else? Once they've agreed, we then release the product to the marketplace. This can take quite a long time delivering the product, as I said, up to 18 months for a legacy built platform. A lot of that work is done up front trying to define what the product is that we're bringing to the market electronically. We also visit different channels, and we work with the different businesses here at the company. And every business is similar but not the same. So what we build as a foundation is reusable and scalable, but always needs to be modified for the next product because they're all a little bit different. And they all react differently in the marketplace, and they're all received differently in the marketplace. So once we start the second or third or fourth product, we're out there visiting the agents and customers in the marketplace again. There's no substitute for getting human intelligence and feedback. The agents and brokers feel they're part of the development process and are eager to adopt the product and take it to the marketplace. And we've had much early success with our recent products because we've done that. And we continue to do that now, and we are also now building products for the Canadian marketplace. And we're in the process of meeting with all the customers and agents throughout Canada. And believe me, they do things differently in Canada than we do here in the United States. We're also building some greenfield products. Those greenfield products, we work with the businesses to understand what they want to do and how they want to do it. And we took 90 days to meet with the business, to get comfortable with the product, understand how the product works today, and understand what the potential for the market, what the potential of the market is on, in a new platform online. Then we went and saw the agents and brokers and asked them for their feedback. And then we went to see their customers and asked them for their feedback. When all was said and done, we realized that the marketplace on a new platform would be 10 times greater than the marketplace done by hand with underwriting involvement directly today. So we've been building that product now for a month and a half, and we release it to the early adopter mode in two weeks. We're very eager to get that product on the street, and that product will be released in North America. And now I'm ready to turn this back to our host. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, like I said, John will be re uh, uh, joining us any second, but uh, wanted to remind our audience again, if you have any questions for Anna or John or just in, or myself or just in general regarding uh, the products and connecting with our consumer engagement, et cetera, please, please use your use your chat to, to enter your questions and we will answer those. Uh, I do have one question so far for Anna. So Anna, the first question we have for you is, how do you manage the cost implication and duplication or storage of paper forms? Uh, so we're, we're doing a lot of work on not having those um, that that workflow be duplicated. And I think for a really long time, lots of people in the industry have tried to work around some of the complexity around the mainframe and that workaround has just created new problems, new technical debt, you know, new um, new issues around kind of this, the source of truth. So we're, we're looking at that problem it, through the lens of trying to solve for the actual root cause issue. So where can we actually do straight through processing? Um, where can we make it easier for clients to not use paper, knowing that 
for some of our older clients, especially, and for some other segments of our clients that are not as digitally astute, paper probably won't go away, but we can mitigate when it's incoming, not duplicating it as we try to decouple some of the ways in the past that we've dealt primarily with paper and move to an all digital model. So it's, it's a bit of a balancing act, but I think my answer really is how do you remove the complexity around managing multiple inputs in a way that doesn't cause duplication as a kind of as a step one and then how far can you push that knowing that you know for some clients for very good reasons we won't get away from it um, and how do they work in concert with one another i hope that answers it yeah no i i you know a lot of a lot of carriers are, are dealing with this challenge of you know duplication of work duplication duplication of documents whether you know once they come in paper turn around scan some kind of imaging um but uh you make a good point in trying not to duplicate the actual process itself to make it that much more uh, of a hassle and an efficient inefficient process um you know the one of the things that came up in my mind is, you know, you talked about Ella and wow, sounds like a great, great story. What, how are you measuring success for Ella? Uh, what are, what, and, and what are maybe some of the bigger findings or aha we moments you've had? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think in the early days, it was getting adoption and, and making people aware that she was there. Um, so really very basic web type metrics. Um, those were kind of leading indicators. So if you, you kind of think about how do you take something and, um, and shepherd it a little bit, because, you know, at first it was very new and different, um, both our clients and some sponsors, as well as some of our employees, it's a very new thing. So they, they have to let people understand what it is you're trying to do and then provide value to people but she's matured enough that now we're actually tracking her metrics not as kind of leading indicators to say hey i think we're on to something here but rather financial metrics around the amount of revenue that she's driven for the company so whereas maybe in the early days for the people that didn't totally get what this you know this chat bot in our mobile app was possibly going to do for us when they start seeing the increase in wealth deposits and they start seeing the ways that she's helping plan sponsors actually save real dollars even the the maybe the uh the early skeptics are very much converted because we're using business metrics not kind of um you know vaporware funny uh organic metrics it's real dollars and cents and you know we also have a ton of qualitative findings from our clients who just love the fact that we're providing them advice and we're doing it in a way that is timely. You know, in Canada during RSP season, Ella was reminding people about the unused room that they had in their tax-free savings account. And for lots of folks, it was just that little nudge that they needed. And so not only do we reap the benefit of those deposits, but lots of clients said, you know, I don't, a lot of other uh, companies that I've done business with in financial services, I certainly don't feel like they're looking out for me. And I, I thank you. Thank you, Ella, for, for reminding me about this. So uh, I think we're really getting to a point where she's growing up um, and she's, she's being able to drive real business results. I, I just have to say, I, I love when <laughs> I've talked to so many people when it comes to different, you know, their 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 chatbots and and stuff like that, and they talk about like their children. She's growing up. I just love to hear it. It, it kind of cracks me up. But uh, yeah, no, I, I've I've watched a lot of these uh, these tools and technologies grow up, as you say, and they are uh, ha providing phenomenal results. To, to carriers such as yourself. And this is a good transition into another audience question. Um, it, to what extent should the human customer experience be, be replaced with a digital one? What are your thoughts around that, Anna? Well, I think it depends. I think pe some people, our clients are not ubiquitous. So different people value different sorts of experiences. I think, you know, as, um, as a baseline, digitizing administrative work that no one wants to do is one place that almost everyone can agree. 
So I don't know a ton of advisors who get a, an immense amount of value filling out paper forms manually. It's time consuming. So ways that we can digitize that to give them back time to do the thing that we value them for, all their expertise, knowledge, and advice is a place to start. Simple things that we make easier for clients, even when they, they really value that in-person uh, relationship with their advisor, they certainly appreciate the time savings when we can digitize administrative work. Um, but then as we go forward, we're really watching different segments and how different segments are interacting differently with us. Um, and I think it's a bit of a misnomer. I, I keep hearing people talk about customers in these age cohorts. And I think digital has really removed a lot of that, that artifice. Uh, we see lots of older customers totally embracing these digital experiences. Uh, we see some younger customers who, you know, maybe this is the first time they purchased insurance, really valuing um, the advice of a, a real person in real life. So as these things get more mature and as we get smarter about what our customers want and how to deliver it, I'm sure you'll see us continue to, to pivot and shift and add new services. But um, I, I think all of it is a bit of a balance. But the one thing is no one wants to key in information five times, advisors, customers, sponsors, nor any of our employees. So um, there's lots of opportunity just in that space that's pretty non-contentious for us to eliminate some friction. Yeah, when you ask, um, you know, some uh, it, just a consumer in general yourself, what does digital mean to you? Taking yourself out of the aspect of of the 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 insurance carrier, um, you know, it, it means very different things to very different people as consumers. It also means very different things to people across an organization when you think about the business and the carrier itself. So being able to pull all that together is, is a challenge. It's difficult. So providing option is almost, you know, it's probably one of the biggest things that I hear that provides the most success. Yes, we can digitize it, but, you know, for the consumer, we can integrate more digital um, advice or whatever. But if the consumer doesn't want it, you need to provide that option of, of getting out, so to speak, and, and having that one-on-one -on -one person to person uh, interaction. Um, so the next question I have for you, Anna, is um, did you hire in-house? Did you do it in-house or did you hire an IT vendor to help you? If you hired a vendor, what was their role? And I assume we're talking, we're still talking about Ella here. So we've done a lot of the Ella work internally. Uh, we have a fairly uh, mature digital team internally that does really great work. We certainly also work with vendors. Um, so it's a bit of a mixture of both, but it wasn't, if the, the question is, did we kind of go out, hire a consultancy to build a thing and throw it back over the fence? No, um, it was a partnership and we have lots of people because uh, on the 10th floor where I work downtown Toronto, let me tell you, I often uh, in an afternoon hear our developers saying, hello, Google, this is Sun Life, <laughs> as they test new workflows uh, and new stories. Gotcha. And then we have one, one of our uh, attendees has a very specific question um, related to Africa. Um, Nigeria in particular, he, sa he or she says that uh, access to reliable internet service is unreliable due to poor tech investment. What other strategies did you develop to break through your customer centricity for paper form clients? For paper formed, um, I we don't do business in Africa. Um, so that is not a challenge that we've had to overcome ourselves um although i'm sure if we decided to to go to market there we'd give that some thought um i, I don't really have a great answer uh, for that i apologize well i, I don't don't apologize too much because i'm racking my brain trying to think about some of those you know uh you know going back way back in my 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 insurance history you know i think it, it it's a challenge to you know, customer centricity is all about providing the right experience. So I think the evaluation of your paper forms and when John comes in, maybe John would have a better uh, answer for this question because he is so specialized and he is, uh, you know, very specialized in, in the types of products. 
No, well, John's on the phone, and we don't oh, do business John. in Africa either. Well, I don't think it's – this isn't really specific to Africa. I think it's about how can you do break – you know, how can you develop some breakthrough customer-centric opportunities when you have to live in such a paper environment? I think that's probably the key to the question here. Well, and I think if, if I can, the answer to yeah. the question from my perspective is you need to meet with those customers, and you need to understand what coverages that they need and what coverages you are capable of providing and de determine the language for the form in, in a method that both legally and ethically works properly for the, the marketplace, the customer, and and bring it to market. And, and we've routinely done that. We've, we have done that for, for Mexico. We've done that for Malaysia and China. Um, where we've had to get into the local marketplace, understand what was needed, and build a product for it. That takes time. So. Right. Um, so welcome, John, again, uh, and thanks. Perfect timing. Perfect timing on that one. Um, the other question is, uh, and I probably it, it says it's directed for Anna, but it's probably something that you could you could both answer as well. It, the question is around uh, process, process management tools. Do you use any business process management tools to help with managing the onboarding process? Um, Anna, do you want to start off there since it was kind of directed towards you? Sure. Um, so I'm quite certain that the folks in the business groups do, in fact use some of those tools. I think as we think about digitization, I think the mistake is to try to digitize an analog process. So when we approach how to think about um, doing the work that we do, but in a digital sphere, I think the mistake is to say, well, we have this process and we just need to digitize it. Because I think, A, a lot of those processes are very complicated because over the last 30 or 40 years, we've had to figure out all the edge cases and the folks that work in head office are incredibly competent at knowing all of those things. But digitizing that, <laughs> I think would be a mistake in the digital world. And, and I work with a lot of our business groups to say, I I'm sure you have a very solid and amazing documented process. Can we for a moment put that to the side? What are we trying to do digitally? How best to do it? And let's think through how we could do it digitally. We may refer back to all the things that we know from the last 150 years of doing business. But I think if we start from the way we've always done things, it becomes really hard to imagine a different way. So in, in the work I do around digital transformation, I don't spend any time with process, old process maps or the way that they've, they've documented those to date. Although I, I'm quite certain that the folks in the business that have been doing the work up until now do use those tools. And John, how about you guys? Well, we don't do things too much differently. Um, and, I, and in order for me to start building a product for one of our business units, we will sit down with them early on in the process and understand from them what they want to do. I want to hear it from them in, you know, layman's terms, what they want to do. And then we specifically tell them that in order to build a product online, the question and answer session that we ask our customers to partic participate in has to be efficient and smooth. And therefore, the product we're offering online needs to be uh, within a box with boundaries that is meaningful for the customer without having them to, to making them spend more than three or four minutes answering questions. So the legacy processes that we've done in the past that may have, you know, we have we have found, and I'm I'm sure everybody on this call that's done insurance has found applications for insurance with 18 questions where only five questions are used to really derive the the, the exposure, the rate, the limit, the deductible, and the price. So we force the business partners that we work with to rethink how they do things and to come back with a much consolidated application. And then we start testing it with the marketplace. And we, and we do that in person to see if it resonates, to see if it works. 
And by the time we're done, if we, if we have more than 10 questions on an application for insurance online, that's a lot. And, and we try to stay less than 10. But it, it takes numerous iterations to get the underwriters, the underwriting management team, the actuaries, all comfortable with fewer questions that are more meaningful. Gotcha. So and the, one other, yesterday, oh, sorry, the yesterday's ahead. process, yesterday's processes are thrown in the water. Right. They don't work. Um, I think uh, another question I had asked Anna um, before, but a good question for you is, you know, how do you measure your success as you go through this process? What are some of the success measures to know that you're doing the right thing and improving um, the customer experience? Well, we actually talk to our customers. We, we, we visit with them on a regular basis. Because we're a specialty insurance market, we don't have tens of thousands of insurance producers. We have a thousand or two thousand around the country, and so and and we get to know them and we talk to them. We get their feedback. We and we ask our insurance customers also what they think. Um, we we learn from their feedback. We incorporate their feedback. We have made numerous changes and numerous iterations in product releases because of feedback we've gotten from the marketplace. Um, you know, every product we build is dynamic and can be changed to, a, to an adapting market. And I, and I measure success by the, the number of submissions that we see on a daily basis and the volume of premium that we write, which continues to exceed month over month our benchmarks. Um, people like our product and, and are using it, and that's a, one of the greatest measures of success in insurance. So... I guess another question here for you uh, direct, directly, John, is as how do you bring the customer's wants and needs into both online and automated service interaction? It's my same answer. We ask them what they need. There you go. Okay. We ask, and, 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 you know, we ask them what they need. We look at what's in the market. We ask them what they don't like about what's in the market. And we try to design a product that fits their needs. I mean, there are things, as any insurer will tell you, that we won't write. And, you know, we, we have to make, it has to make business sense. But if there's a product that they need that they're not getting, we'll sit down with our legal folks and see if we can craft a product that addresses that need. And then we'll bring it back to them and ask them if it works. And I got to tell you, it doesn't always work. Right. No, absolutely. Trial and error. Test and learn. Test and learn. That's what our industry is is based on. So, um, absolutely. One of the uh, here's a, it's kind of a statement and a question, I guess, for for both of you. Um, and I guess we'll start with you. Is the statement is Gartner recently stated that 48% of insurers will have AI, artificial intel intelligence, in production within 12 weeks, or, or already have it. Uh, how how advanced are you in in use in your use of artificial intelligence within your organization, Anna? I th I think I think it's a hard hard question to answer only because at least my personal bias is it's such a slippery question. Um, certainly, I think Gartner's right that everyone has looked at it. Lots of people have deployed it um, in tests, sometimes in production, sometimes with big plans, sometimes with tactical plans. I mean how advanced uh, there's just there's so much buzz around what's real and what's you know future looking i think that definition is problematic but i agree with their, their statement uh and certainly we would fall into the camp of you know investigating using piloting believe it to be important but i i think that that's i mean that's table stakes i mean i don't think there's any um controversy over that it's just what form will it take um, where will there be actual value? How will things start to work together? Um, how long will it take to kind of be, have the fundamental data required to fuel AI? So the technology is there, but um, the right use case with the right data is going to take a little time to tinker with. Yeah, I agree. Uh, and, and what about you, John? Well, in the products that we're building, we do use some uh, AI in a limited basis. Um, but I think on, on a bigger picture basis, our, our parent company up at the Intact Labs in Montreal, they use it 
substantially on the personal line side of the house. Um, and they've got it deployed for a numerous things, including um, some of the claim operation. Uh, we can actually receive pictures of the damage, physical damage on an automobile um, and, and determine what the value is to fix the car and send a check out to the customer. I mean, that's in limited trial. Uh, and I'm not working on that, but I just I read about it and I see what they're doing. Well, we're not using it on that scale and what we built here in One Beacon Marketplace, but we are using it. It, it helps speed the customer's in act interaction with the system um, incredibly. It makes the experience incredibly faster using the AI interfaces that we are deploying. Um, we we are four weeks away from putting our our first product with um, built-in AI. Uh, out to market, and we've been testing it with um, with glowing reviews from the marketplace. So that's great. But it is it is it is a slippery slope. You have to be careful, and you have to be careful what you ask for, right? <laughs> So very true. Uh, we, we've also done some research on this um, recently, and we'll have a report coming out uh, in, in late August. Um, but my particular findings in this area, when asked if they're using artificial intelligence or machine learning, 28.3% uh, uh, are currently using it, with an additional 17.5% uh, planning on using it by the end of the year, so right around the 45 percent, so um, very close to what Gartner sees as well. But going out, you know, by the by the end of 2020, an additional 22 percent will be using it. So uh, it's one of those table stakes, but it's a slippery slope into how you use it, the extent that you use it, and making sure you're using it for the right reason. So. Um, so that, you know, I think in closing, when we have a couple of minutes here, I think uh, I'd love to hear uh, just quickly, Anna, John, uh, one recommendation you would give to our audience who's going through the same things that you're going through or have gone through, give them one tidbit of advice to leave them with um, as, as we say goodbye. Anna? I loved that John not only gave the answer of go ask people, but then reiterated that, that answer so succinctly, because I think uh, we forget to do that. And, you know, I've asked internally a number of times, so who wanted this? Uh, I think the idea of cooking up great ideas in executive boardrooms is done. Uh, it's, a, it's an unnatural and it's a new kind of muscle and skill that carriers need to start to build. But I think the more people go out and speak to advisors, brokers, customers, and non-customers. So, you know, it's great to go talk to the folks that have bought all your products and are happy, but they're probably not representative of the next group of customers that you want to sell through. So not only your customers, but the folks that you would like to have as customers and start there. Start with what, it, what are the problems that they're looking to solve for? Um, how can you create solutions that make their lives easier? Uh, and it's messy, you know, in a world full of actuaries, this qualitative research makes people kind of squirm, but it's really important to start there. Thanks, I couldn't Anna, agree with you. Uh, Anna, I couldn't agree with you more. It does make the actuary squirm. Here's, <laughs> here's one piece of advice I suggest that everybody take. Never go into the marketplace assuming you know what the customer wants. You 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 need to understand the market you're going to and what they want. You also need to understand what language they understand. The younger generations do not understand us old guys. You know that we have to we have to put things in terms they understand. We have to deliver products in uh, in a medium that they will use. So. We go into the marketplace with very open minds, with no preconceived notions, and we ask them for um, their thoughts. You know, what is it that they're looking to protect? How do they want to protect it? How do they perceive insurance? You know, insurance gets a bad rap for a reason. We don't always do it right. Um, so we're working very hard to make sure that we never assume anything and in that the customer needs to explain to us in their words what it is they're looking for. And it does make people in the boardroom uncomfortable. 
and it does make the actuaries uncomfortable, but it's reality. This is the next generation of a product we're building. That's great. That's great advice from both of you. I really appreciate your time today. I hope everybody on the call got some uh, good information. Please feel free to reach out to, to me on, on LinkedIn. And if you have any other questions, we can generate that through, through Paul, Anna, and John as well. Thank you so much again for your time. Have a wonderful day, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.